Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Stephen, and I'm here to help out as your moderator this evening. So uh, we're glad you could join us. Um, I'm very excited to uh, welcome to this evening's webinar, Natalie Rogers, Director of Business Development with ESIS Dental Solutions as our speaker tonight for five ways to increase claim reimbursement. So before I hand off to Natalie, uh, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to take a moment just to go over a couple of points of housekeeping. So first of all, if you have a question at any point during this evening's presentation, you can go ahead and type that into the uh, Q&A box um, at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try and get to as many of your questions uh, at the end of this as possible. And the second point, C, is not available for this webinar, and that applies to whether you're watching that now live or later on demand. So with that, Natalie, welcome. I'm going to pass it on over to you now. Thank you. Hello, hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining me this evening or afternoon, just kind of depending on where you are located. I am super thrilled to be here. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I'm Natalie Rogers. I am with ESS Dental Solutions on the business development side, and I love this position so much. I get to talk to doctors and office managers across the U.S. and help them put streamlined processes in place to better increase their insurance revenue and focus on all the things it takes to grow a dental practice. Um, started my career out as a dental assistant, hygiene school, front desk, office manager, and now I've been with ESIS going on seven years and loving being a part of this dental world. So I'd like to thank ESS for allowing me to present to you today, and I want to tell you a little bit about them before we get into the meat of the presentation. We are here to help practices focus on patient care while we give that peace of mind that the insurance revenue is coming in consistently without pause or delay. Delivering peace of mind for more than 10 years, we love helping offices grow. So what I'm hoping we'll learn today, um, and you may find little gems here and there, some things you may already know. So I know we've got people joining who are been in the dentist, dental world for a while and others who are just joining. So three items I'm hoping we're going to help out with today is learn how to send some squeaky clean claims with minimized scrubbing, why your clinical notes directly impact your dental claim reimbursement, and then recognize when you should appeal a denied claim and when you shouldn't. So I've got our first poll today, this um, presentation, there's a couple of them, so stay on your toes with me. But our first poll is, on average, how many insurance claim denials do you receive per week? Now, while you guys fill this out, I know there are a lot of different um, size practices with us on this webinar. So five to 10 denials may not be as much as others. It's not always about the number, but what are on the claim denials. So if you've got five denials for crowns, that could be five to 10K, depending on the fee that you have and negotiation rates with for that crown. And that's where we're, that money really adds up. So um, kind of those questions are, I don't know how many are outstanding or how many claim denials I get weekly. I've got a stack of EOBs from last week still behind me, one to five, five to 10 or 10 plus. So I'll let you guys kind of look over those options and let me know. Perfect. Oh, great. Awesome. So we're seeing anywhere um, for those of us joining today, one to five or five to 10 denials coming in weekly. Again, depending your size of the practice, one to five could be a ton, one to five could be a minimal amount, but it's about the how much is on that claim. So if it's a claim that you're getting denied frequently and the code frequently definitely puts a damper in that revenue process. So thank you so much for participating in that. All right, sending squeaky clean claims. So what is a clean claim? First, let's make sure that you're using the correct claim form. The most recent claim form is your ADA 2019 version. So if you're using the 2012 or any other ones, those are older, they are no longer the current one. Um, if you're sending those claims, you can still get claims paid on there. There's not a huge difference between the 2012 and the 2019 claim format but the 2019 is your most current one. So if you are using anything else, time to update those and make sure you're sending them out correctly. Other items that we'll be diving more into to start um, the repetition here, right? It says sometimes you gotta hear things, see things, write things three times for it to retain. So just kind of planning that seed here, but we're gonna dive into 
correct insurance information, correct patient information, correct provider info, CDT codes, and all necessary supporting documentations. All of that goes into making a clean claim for us. So we want to send clean claims daily. This helps with timely reimbursement, which is crucial to ensure revenue is not paused. It also helps with patient retention. No one likes to receive a bill in the mail. So the sooner you get those claims sent out correctly, the sooner that those payments come in, the sooner that if there is any forward balances, that allows you the ability to send those forward balances to your patients in a timely manner. So it's really important that you guys are finding a process that works with your practice on when to send these out daily. I know most practices send them out at the end of the day, but look at that process. See if that's what's the best fit for you. It may not be. I have been noticing that the offices that send their claims next business day are able to really review those claims, the codes, everything on it that needs to go clean and send them out correctly the first time. They're kind of more uninterrupted in the morning as the day is going versus at the end of the day, right? Patients run over, emergencies come in that turn into longer procedures. You've got to go to kids' um, appointments, dances, whatever it is. Sometimes we've got to leave at the end of the day. Those claims aren't going to go anywhere. Go ahead and put them in your batch processor and maybe look at them the next business day to see um, if that kind of makes sure that those claims are going out a better process for you guys on accurate claim filing. All right, let's get started with one, develop a pre-appointment readiness plan. So a pre-appointment readiness plan is a great process to add in. The more accuracy you have on the claim format and also the patient file is going to help ensure that that claim is processed the first time. Items that this um, pre-appointment plan should include is collecting patient and subscriber information. Um, that is things like their date of birth, their full legal name. A lot of time patients are going by middle names, nicknames. Um, maybe they recently got married, but they haven't changed their name over. So they give you their married name, but their insurance is under their maiden name. So making sure you collect all the appropriate data for that. Um, collecting insurance payer information. There are multiple locations. So you want to make sure that you've got the right payer so that claims going to the right location. Uh, getting a breakdown of benefits. I recommend getting those breakdown of benefits prior to your patients coming into the practice. One of the main reasons is because I don't know about you guys, but I remember a patient would walk in, you'd greet them and you'd say, hey, I checked on your dental insurance. It looks like it's been terminated. Do you have another policy that we could use for today's coverage? And they, they're surprised. They're like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. Maybe they forgot to refile with their HR company during that filing time. Uh, it's happened where the husband forgot to refile the wife before. And so then your patient's like, can I cancel? I'll reschedule. And now you're left without a same day opening and your production is just, you know, with no patience. So I find if you get those breakdown of benefits before they come in. It gives you some time to reach out to your patient if there is anything odd or unique going on with their policy. So you can refill production time if there's a cancellation or have conversations in advance to again, build that retention and that trust with your patient on what their fees may be in case there, there turned out there wasn't insurance or at all. So we wanna also attach the correct CDT codes to the claim. We all wanna have our insurance claim processed and paid quickly. One of the reasons we find that there's a pause and delay in the insurance re reimbursement starts with the coding. So staying on top of your yearly changes is really important. Within the last three years, there's been over 160 CDT updates and changes. I'll say that again, last three years, there have been over 160 updates. So if you haven't updated your code manuals, you could be getting denials from the insurance due to incorrect codes that are now deleted, or you could even be getting incorrect and lower reimbursement rights. This year alone, so 2023, there are 22 new codes and there are 14 revised codes for this year. A couple of the revised codes are some that you're probably using on a daily. So for example, your 4355, full mouth debridement, and also the 0210, your FMX, those codes have been updated. So make sure that you have reviewed what those updates are so you're coding them correctly and not leaving any money on the table. The golden rule of dentistry is to always code for what you do. 
Without up-to-date coding resources, you have no idea if what you're reporting is even accurate and puts this practice at risk for audits and lost revenue. As you can see here, this quote by Dr. Charles Blair, when you are coding what you do to the insurance, even if it's a non-covered benefit, we're showing the insurance company that these codes are important and need to be reimbursed. So when you're not billing the insurance company a code that you know is not gonna be covered, you're basically telling the insurance company, we don't need to cover it. This, don't worry about reimbursing it ever in the future. We're not gonna invoice it. So make sure you are always billing what you do, where, where you're doing it, which location, and who's rendering the services. Um, we wanna show the insurance companies why it's important for them to reimburse it and always put the patient's oral hygiene care first. Don't let the insurance company dictate when or when you shouldn't be billing, just code what you do. So options for updating resources. There are um, a couple different ones out there. So the ADA has two publications, one of which is basically a list of current codes and the other is what they call the companion. So the Compan companion is a good publication full of questions and answers and examples about codes. And it is, it's worth having. It's really important that you guys find a manual that fits your, guy, your practice needs. Um, another great option is your practice booster. This one is annually updated coding with confidence manual, which has well over 500 pages of codes, explanations, um, examples, narratives, it's almost like uh, it, like a street light. It says green, fill if you do this, yellow caution, don't fill, possibly look at these codes, or red, do not bill if this is what you do, bill this alternatively. So the practice booster, coding with confidence is a great way to go as well. Practice booster also has an online subscription. Um, this offers support and references through newsletters, the code advisor podcasts, insurance administrative guidebooks. There's medical dental billing coding cross coding books. Um, there's also with technology, they now have new technology books coming out to help with coding for those things as well. Um, so make sure that you're getting the right book fit for you. Um, and just an FYI, in case you guys didn't know, there is a code maintenance committee that meets in Chicago every March to review proposed changes to the CDT code set. So this is why your codes are being updated annually. There's a group of individuals who get together and review all of the codes and kind of pick and say, these ones need updated, these don't. But they don't just pick them on their own. They also want to hear these proposed changes from you. So if you feel like there's a, something that's missing from the CDT code book, or if there's something outdated or needs to be clarified, you can go to the ADA website to submit a proposed change. These do need to be done though by November 1st in order for it to be on the agenda for review the following March. So they want to hear your voice. Your voice is important. Make sure it's heard and go to the ADA um, website to get any proposed changes on there that you feel are necessary. Great example, though, um, of some changes is our occlusal guard. There used to only be one code for that, and now there's a handful. Also, the comb beam. When the comb beam first came out, we were invoicing 9999 codes, and now there is actually codes and CDT options for comb beams, multiple out there. So they do hear your voice, um, which is really awesome. So staying on top of yearly changes is really important. Great options to ensure that you're always up to date, especially with the yearly constant changes with those updates. Sometimes they add new codes, sometimes they take codes out, and sometimes they take current codes and they just revise them. So if you haven't updated your CDT code book, get with your Henry Shinerap. They'll be able to help find the best coding resource for you and for your practice. There are also other coding options out there for medical cross-coding, ICD-10 codes, um, action items like that. So your Henry Schein representative is going to be one of the best resources to help find the best fit for your practice. Okay, time to obtain all necessary clinical documentation. So I was scrolling through LinkedIn a couple months ago. And I came across something interesting from one of my colleagues in the dental industry who had given an analogy about how when we're in a car wreck, our car insurance is embedded into our brain 
that if you're in an accident, you need to document, document, document. They tell us to take photos. They tell us to take videos. They tell us to take statements. Any possible thing you can do to document your car and the other vehicle in the accident's car helps your insurance pay for your car to get repaired or replaced if it's un unrepairable. So why isn't the same concept when it comes to dentistry? A lot of us do use the same concept, but it is so integral that we are documenting everything that's going on in the practice, not only to help claims get reimbursed, but also for our licenses. So document, document, document. All right, so after um, your, after this patient soap notes are done, we wanna verify the clinical team has signed off on the notes entered. So make sure you're signing those clinical notes. We're seeing more insurance companies deny major treatment without a copy of signed clinical notes from the provider. They're, not, they're no longer wanting just that narrative in that claim support box, but they're actually wanting to see the signed clinical notes. And you can send those in either if you're doing paper charting or, you know, a great best practice is to have everything digitally charted. Most of the practice management softwares allow you to di digitally sign them, which also helps lock in that no and show that, hey, this is what we documented and we're confirming it. Um, in case you were wondering, because I know I have individuals on this webinar with me who have been in practice for years, but maybe some who are newer. I know I just said the word soap notes. I want to make sure I kind of define that for you as well. Soap notes are your subject, objective, assessment, and your plan. So the subject is, why is the patient in the office? Well, what have they communicated to you as their primary complaint, the history of the illness, basically what's going on in their mouth? Um, the objective is finding out the examination. What do you see? What are their vital signs? What what, um, you know, that's where we want to document what we're seeing as well with x-rays, intraorals, perio charting. Objective is going to be their vital signs. Um, and then we have, oh, sorry, <laughs> just went over that. But we also have the assessment then. So diagnosing, the evidence behind the diagnosis, if applicable and the reasoning you found the diagnosis. And then P plan, how will you be treating the patient's concerns? So that's a great way to do your narrative and documentations is using those soap note templates um, to make sure that you are referencing everything for all your patients and you're not missing anything. All right, I've got another poll for us. So what type of documentations are you most likely to forget? I've got oral cancer screening, date of prior existing restoration or your TMJ. So while you guys are filling out this poll, when it comes to documentation, little pro tip here, but most insurances will no longer pay for buildups unless there is clear documentations, not only your narrative and clinical notes explaining why that needs to be done, but also they want your pre-op x-ray, a post-op x-ray, a PA showing the little empty box for where the decay previous was and the filling's been removed to show the need for the core buildup placement. But also they're going to want an intraoral of the core buildup before the crown goes on. You can't see a buildup through a PA after the crown's been seated. So make sure you're gathering all four of those pieces um, when it comes to imagery to help get those P or buildups paid for if it is allowable. Okay, awesome. Thanks guys for participating in this. Looks like 88% of us are forgetting to get that day of prior existing restoration. Oh, that one can definitely be one that we forget, right? Patient comes in, needs a crown. We do the treatment sometimes same day, they leave, you bill it out. And then 30 days later, when that claim's not paid, it's because we definitely forgot to grab that information. So getting that um, patient history on when they had restorations is going to be super helpful as well to make sure those claims get paid and processed that first time. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Critical supportive clin clinical documentation. So now this list here has a ton of supportive documentations that can be added onto a claim, but this does not need to be submitted with every code. 
So like we reviewed a couple side backs, having updated CDT coding books and manuals will help show when documents, images, perio charting should be submitted to the insurance company per code. So for example, a prophylaxis would not need any additional documentation sent with it. So make sure you're not adding more work on your plate and sending in everything, send what they need. They don't want to see anything extra and they may deny it because you sent in too much. So um, here's a list of different things that are commonly seen for codes that we're building out on a daily. So why is supportive clinical documentations on a claim important? We found that over 80, went, blah, 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 blah. there we go, right? It's the end of the day for me, guys. I, <laughs> so let me try that again. I just get really excited. Um, we have found that 80% of the work that it takes to collect what is produced must be done on the front end. If things aren't done accurately prior to sending a claim, you're losing money spending the time and resources to chase down those errors. Denials due to inaccurate information are avoidable. Putting a process in place where everyone in the office understands what needs to be done prior to a claim being sent out starts with ensuring you have all the correct information on the claim. So right here, you can see there's a lot of information that we can add onto a claim. So knowing the CDT code books and the codes you're billing out will also help correlate to what you are putting on your claim to ensure you're not chasing down your money later, that that reimbursement from the insurance is coming in pretty quickly for you then. All right, support the appeal process. Now, I know I mentioned how we should always submit to the insurance what we do and by who does it. And sometimes we know it's a non-covered benefit on the policy. So when it's a non-covered benefit and it comes back, AKA say you're billing out a fluoride and the policy for that patient is it's only allowed for 16 and under and the patient's 20 years old, we wanna make sure we're still billing out the fluoride to the insurance company. But when that comes back denied, there's no need to appeal it. Go ahead and close that claim out and forward balance. So we're going to kind of dive in on what kind of denials are out there and when to appeal. That's the keyword, when to appeal. We don't want to be spending a lot of time and energy into things that we know are non-covered. So go ahead and close them out, but do make sure to still build them to the insurance carrier. All right. So according to industry leader and dental coding expert, Dr. Charles Blair, only 33% of denied claims are appealed. And this is not due because we just don't want to appeal them. It's because sometimes we don't know we should or when we should, or sometimes the office is really busy. So that stack of EOBs just kind of stay there. Um, so Regardless of the reason why these items aren't being appealed, we're finding 70% of dentists are leaving money on the table and it's really putting a pause and delay in that insurance revenue while we're trying to focus on practice growth. So that kind of adds up, right? We're leaving money on the table. Let's take a look at how 9% could add up for us. 9% a year sounds small, but really it adds up over time. Um, so this is just an average annual gross billing for our example. You may be a smaller practice around this size, or you may be a larger practice, but if your annual gross billing is about 732K, 9% on the table for 40 years is about $2 million, which is a lot of money. There's a lot of things you could be doing with that. You could be buying new locations, expanding, um, buying equipment buying, you know, more products for your office. If you're not sure what else to spend it on, call me up. I will help you find a way to spend it, but I'm sure your staff would love 401ks, vacation packages, a lot of things out there. All right. So looking at the different types of denials, disallowed claim rejections, when to appeal and when not to appeal. So we've got three different kinds of, um, items that can come up when a claim is not going to be paid by the insurance company. The first one is your rejected claim. This is one that's been kicked back as a result of a line item on the claim form, which cannot be processed. So this could mean that the CDT code was a denied claim or den no longer in use, right? It's a denied code. So if you put in a deleted code, it's going to be rejected. The claim has to be reviewed for accuracy, and then you've got to correct it, resubmit it, 
um, which then can be frustrating and avoidable, right? This is something that can be avoidable by making sure we're adding the correct code to your claim. So roadblocks to timely compensation, we definitely wanna make sure that those, the revenue is coming in. If you're seeing rejected claims often, you might wanna look at your process in place for how, and then also when you're filing those claims. Again, I mentioned earlier, maybe the end of the day isn't the best process for your practice. Maybe try sending them that next morning. They're not going anywhere. They're sitting there in that batch processor. You can also pull reports in your system, the treatment not attached to insurance claims which will also help you catch any missed ones that need to be batched as well. Um, other things that can be cause rejected claims is if the payer ID number is wrong. Maybe you sent that claim to, you know, one insurance company's location that's in California and it was supposed to go to New Jersey's location. So make sure you've got that correct payer ID, the patient information is wrong, um, date of birth, spelling of a name that can also cause a rejected claim. So when you see these denials, these are ones that we wanna take the time to review and appeal. The next one is our disallowed claims. Now, when a procedure is disallowed, the insurance payer has, to dis the insurance payer has determined that it doesn't qualify for adjudication per the patient's plan. Disallowed procedures aren't billable to the patient and should be written off um, the EOB states that they are inclusive too. Sometimes you'll see that. Um, so when you see the disallowed, sometimes, yes, these are ones that are not appealable, but other times they are appealable. So again, knowing your patient's policy as well as that CDT code book, that's why we want to see that process flow. We're getting breakdowns first, making sure our CDT coding is up to date because if you see an inclusive two, sometimes that's incorrect. Sometimes they're just needing additional documentation, those clinical notes to get those things overturned. Um, a big one I see is your core buildups. So core buildups can be considered inclusive two if it doesn't meet the qualifications to be a core buildup. Now, if it does meet those qualifications, right? So much of the tooth percentage is missing, it's needed to fully retain and restore the crown. Other items on there as well. Um, usually they just want more documentation. Usually they're looking for prep and seat day, pre and post x-rays. So knowing your CDT codes is gonna help you know when you should and should not spend the time and energy to appeal your disallowed claims. And then finally, we have your denied claims. So when a claim is denied, the insurance payer has to determine that the claim doesn't qualify for reimbursement. And the reason why will be stated on the explanation of benefits. So if the claim is denied due to missing data or filling errors, that's an appealable reason. So take a look at that verification that you got and make sure that this denied claim is correct. I know I mentioned the fluoride example earlier. If a fluoride is covered to a certain age limit, say it's 16, your patient's 15, and that came through as denied, that is an appealable claim. So really important, you're still getting those breakdown of benefits prior to that patient coming in. Because I don't know if you notice, but it's almost like a domino effect. It's a, it's a streamlined ripple effect, like starting at the very beginning for that pre-appointment plan all the way down to hitting that submit button, the claim is going to help ensure that that reimbursement is coming in quickly for us. So streamline that dental billing process. We here have created a visual for the revenue cycle pipeline in your dental practice. You can see that that revenue cycle starts when the patient schedules and it goes all the way down to where that balance is collected from your patient or the insurance carrier as well. So where do you have cracks um, that could be leaking the revenue? The ones in bold are the most commonly missed or fumbled processes that cause inconsistent revenue. Streamlining as many of these processes as possible keeps your revenue consistent, allowing you to focus on increasing your production um, through better patient care, treatment plan acceptance, marketing, adding associates, adding days to your practice, the list goes on. So if you guys want to take a picture or screenshot of this slide here, as you can see, starts with that patient schedules, and then it's that domino effect that we've kind of been talking about this whole time all the way through.
And that's where eAssist comes in. So eAssist is here to help support your office, send clean claims, streamline your dental billing processes, and this support the appeal process to make sure there's never a pause or delay in your insurance revenue. This opens up and allows your amazing in-office team to focus on what matters, growing your practice and your patients. So um, I know they're wearing a lot more hats than that, but this opens up their ability to really level up and focus their time and attention on, on your practice production itself and patient experience. Well, we're here to make sure that there's never that pause or delay. So this is why dentists need to, um, to make sure that you guys sit down, look at your current processes and find out where are those holes in your process? I'll click back again. Where are those leaks in your pipes that is maybe stopping or preventing your revenue from coming in? Let us know if we can help with any of that. So final poll for us, friends. Would you like to have someone from ESS reach out to you for a free consultation to learn more? Our options are yes, please, or not at this time. Thank you. I am hoping most of us hit the yes, please, because we definitely would love to come in and talk to you about your processes and see how we can level your administrative team up. And that way you can have that peace of mind and focus on your patient care. So I'll give everyone a minute to kind of send in their polls for me on this one. How are we doing, Stephen? We ready for that Q&A? I think we are ready. Yeah, yeah. Why don't we um, Why don't we go ahead and open this up to you guys? Um, you can see on the bottom of your screen the Q&A button. If you have a question for Natalie, go ahead and you can pop that in there and then we'll try and answer as many of your questions as possible. Um, okay, Natalie, first question we've got here. Um, is eAssist a contract or a monthly service? Can you help us out with that? Oh, great question. So eAssist is month to month with 30 day cancellations notice. We're really here to help build that trust with you, marry our processes together. So we don't want you locked into any gym membership that you're not going to use. So month to month for you. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Natalie. Great. All right. Let's see. Next question. Do all insurances have the same payer ID? Mm, yes, payer ID. So no, not all have the same pair ID. So when you are calling your, um, in, to get those breakdown of benefits for your patients, the insurance company, one of the main questions you should put on your breakdown form is what is that company's payer ID? That way, when you're inputting that patient's breakdown of benefits into your practice management software, you can plug the payer ID and the insurance address in there as well to help ensure that that's going out to the right location. Okay, awesome. Thank you. All right, next question. I think you may have addressed this, but um, how many new CDT codes were there this year? Oh, yeah. So 22 new ones and 14 revised. And don't quote me on this, but I think there's two deleted ones this year. Um, but between now and the last two years, so three, three years total, we've got 160 updates. So Really make sure that you update that CDT information so you can code out what you do and help increase that reimbursement. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay, I don't see any more questions for now. Um, do you have anything you'd like to add before we uh, close out, Natalie? Um, just right here, these next couple slides. This one talks about how to get in touch with myself or um, eAssist. And then you can visit henryshinedental.com for webinars to join in for more webinars. And hope you guys enjoyed this one. I hope you learned a lot. Hope you grabbed some gems, some tips and tricks. And yeah, I'm excited for you guys all to get to the office tomorrow and put some in place and make it a good one.
Awesome. Thank you so much, Natalie, for a wonderful presentation uh, this evening. And thank you all of you for joining us um, uh, live for tonight's webinar. Um, so good news is we did record this evening's webinar and we'll be emailing out that recording at some point during the next week. Um, we would really appreciate your feedback in just one minute. A survey is going to pop up on your screen and we'd love it if you could fill that in for us. So with that, thank you again, Natalie. Thank you to all of you for joining us and uh, we look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Thanks so much. Bye, guys. Have a great evening.